Hello, everyone, and thank you for being with us today for today's MNCs, and for those of you watching the feedback through the playbacks. My name is Janet Glick, and I am the Associate Director of On-Campus Events for the Alumni Association. If you're interested in more of these programs, you can find them on our Powered By webpage or on the College Calendar of Events. Before we get started, we would love to know what milk and cookie you have right now, if any. To let us know, please use the chat feature that is located in the bottom of your screen. It is located in the center of the screen and we'll have a notification indicator on it right now. This is the same spot that you'll wanna drop any questions you might have for Olivia throughout this conversation. I'm happy to now introduce Olivia Aguilar, who is Leslie and Sarah Miller Director of the Miller Worley Center for the Environment and Associate Professor of Environmental Studies. Olivia, welcome. Thank you. Hi. I gotta, let me, let me uh... Olivia, can you quickly share what your pronouns are, pronouns are and tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, then we'll dive into the heavy hitting questions. Sure. Um, so Olivia here. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, I just joined on, um, well, I, I started at Mount Holyoke uh, in the fall with a sabbatical, lucky me, and um, I'm working on a book project, um, which I'm happy to talk about a little bit more, um, and then started as the director in January. So I had a couple of months, two and a half months, um, a little bit before we left campus. That was um, a, a little interesting beginning to the, my position there. But um, my background is, um, I have two degrees in horticulture and really started getting interested in um, the use of gardens really as a way to get people interested in the environment and involved in, um, in environmental thinking and behaviors. And um, I then went on to teach um, in public schools and also saw some issues with science education in the public schools. and. Um, really felt like there was maybe more to think about in terms of how to engage um, students and predominantly students of color with the sciences through um, environmental issues and, and things like the garden. So I went on to pursue my PhD in natural resources. Um, and then since then, I've, I've, that's been my, um, my passion really is looking at how to involve people um, in the sciences in, in environmental issues, in and around environmental issues. Um, and so from that, I, I think that I have a pretty broad and general um, background. I sort of consider myself a generalist in environmental studies, um, but that's allowed me actually to teach a variety of topics. And um, so in terms of teaching, I teach, um, getting back to my roots in horticulture, I teach a lot about um, um, uh, food and sustainable agriculture. And, um, and then my passion is in environmental education and I teach in environmental education, but that uh, also really involves a lot of environmental issues. So I, I really enjoy teaching about climate change. Um, so that is sort of all my, my teaching experience. And then my research is also around um, issues of, of inclusivity in environmental education. And so my, my book project that I was talking about currently is collecting oral histories from um, Latinx members and um, asking them about their sort of earliest memories of being outdoors and trying to really reframe and, and reshape what it means for people to be outdoors. Wow, you have a lot on your plate. <laughs> I, well, that's my sort of background as an academic. And then, you know, as the center director, hopefully you I think you're going to ask me questions about what, what we're doing at the center and that'll um, maybe give people a bit more vision of how I'm bringing all of that into the center too. So I'm excited Wonderful. to talk about that. Wonderful. Well, being a fairly new uh, in your position, I want to welcome you to Mount Holyoke College. Um, Thank you. Can you just share with us um, how your first few months have been? I mean, half on campus, half off campus. And yeah, it's, right. I mean, I think, you know, obviously there are some uh, abrupt changes, but um, we've managed as a team to really, I think, uh, keep the energy going, which is great. So on campus, you know, um, January starts off budget month, budget month uh, essentially, but we really try to work closely with the students that work in the center. We have about nine students that work closely with the center. And um, so we really tried to engage with them. Um, they started to do some programming we actually planned for a lot of programming that was meant to sort of take off in March and, and April. 
Um, we were able to do some of that virtually, um, but luckily I think some of the students really kicked off some cool programming in, um, in February um, before we sort of had to take off. Um, and then once we did get, you know, once we moved away from campus, we tried to maintain um, the, student, the student workers that we had with the center as much as possible to keep them engaged. Um, and we were able to keep all of them and we would start to meet um, weekly on Zoom, just like this. And it actually felt, uh, you know, we had been sort of building team and community while we were on campus. Um, and then I think we were able to keep that momentum and keep it going um, by keeping the students involved when, when we left campus. And so the students actually were the ones that planned our big virtual event um, in April, our, our Earth Day week event. Um, and so if anybody um, follows us, the Miller Worley Center on Facebook or on um, Twitter, um, we also, our Instagram page is um, Sustainable MHC. Um, then you can see sort of the virtual activities we did for Earth Day Week. And the students were really the ones behind that and helped to come up with those ideas. And then we just tried to um, execute them um, virtually. And so that was pretty fun, uh, a fun activity for us. And then we had a, an end of the year retreat, um, again on Zoom, it looked a little different than what we had planned on doing. But I think that was also really a fruitful discussion in terms of thinking about the vision of the center and how we want to move forward. Um, and, and so the students for me have, are always sort of at the heart of things. And I think we were able to sort of make sure that that was the case while we were on campus and then keep that going through these virtual meetings once we, once we left campus. But in terms of the center, I mean, you know, we, a lot of what we do is programming. And so um, there was a quick sort of shift to figure out and we're still thinking about how do we move that programming to a virtual, um, a virtual platform that doesn't seem overwhelming for people. So sort of like milk and cookies now being virtual, you know, this is this is the type of thing that we're thinking through. Yeah, that's the same thing the Alumni Association has been thinking as well. Is how can we engage with alums virtually because we can't bring them to campus right now? And as you mentioned, MNCs is one of the things um, we do virtual back to classes. We have other interviews as well going on. So. Um, this is a great way to engage with people. So thank you. Yeah, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna lighten it up a little bit and find out what your go-to MNC is. Like, what do you? What kind of cookie and drink do you? Right, like? right. So this is a, I have been anticipating this question, and it's a good one, but it's also hard. I because my time on campus was short. Um, I was living actually in another faculty's house in in Amherst and taking care of her pets. So. Usually, once I left work, um, that was it. So I have yet to have a chance to actually go to, to MNCs. And I've heard it's slightly different, and there's a little bit more options than the actual cookies. Um, but I typically like, so I have my, instead of MNCs, I have coffee and muffins. So it's still an MNC, but a little different. And I, and I really like, can you see this? Chocolate, chocolate is my typical go-to. So as much chocolate I can get, that's what I'm usually interested in. <laughs> you and me both. Okay, good. <laughs> well, we have a few people that have talked about their favorites. Um, uh, tahini chocolate chip cookie. That sounds delicious. Yeah, it does. Um, mm -hmm. PB and J and cold brew for me, but mm -hmm. Mrs. M and C's in the spirit. Uh huh. Yep. Uh, I like a see. good cold brew too. Yes. Um, a tea and a Vienna wafer. Sounds lovely. Espresso with milk. Uh, chocolate chip with Earl Grey tea, mm. and then someone has some skim milk in her coffee mug and last night made a small batch of sour cream cookies with Greek yogurt instead of sour cream. Ooh, that actually sounds good. That does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It'd be nice if we could share this, right, uh, <laughs> through the screen. Carolyn, can you share the recipe? <laughs> <laughs> so um, what is the best thing that's happened to you this week? So this week, I'm going to include Friday because it's Friday. Um, I came back. I, I actually took a trip um, to Texas. That's where I'm from. And my family is, is still in Texas. Um, so I drove down there to try to be as safe as I could to see my grandmother. She's turning 93 in a couple of weeks. And, uh, and Texas is opening up. And then, you know, the, the news is out that cases are on the rise. So I thought I better take a visit while I um, had some time and before things got a little out of hand there. So I um, took an 11 day trip and six of those days I spent driving and, but I was able to see 
most of my family while I was there, which was really nice. Um, so I just got back last, I got back on Saturday. So I'm including that as part of the week. And that was a really great trip. I was a little nervous, but uh, it was, I, we were all safe and it was just really great to, to see them. I, I hadn't seen them uh, probably since Thanksgiving last year. And, um, you know, just, I think given the uncertainty of things right now, um, for me trying to see family when I can, is really important. So that was a good, that was a good trip. Yeah, that sounds like a great thing to do right now. I, I have family across the country as well. I wish I could get to see them. So, but I'm glad you were able to meet with your family. That's yeah, wonderful. thanks. Like I said, it was six days of driving. It was a little <laughs> intense, but, um, you know, I had, had a lot of, I had Hamilton on and, and kept myself pretty busy. So it was good. Great. Mm-hmm. So tell me what your favorite place on campus is. I think, I mean, um, again, still new, but I really enjoy, I I make excuses sometimes to walk through the Botanic Garden. Um, Probably has to do with my background a little bit, Um, but I love to be able to to go to the Botanic Garden and and sit there. Um, When I first visited campus, it was also one of my favorite spots. There was like a story trail happening when I first visited campus there, which I thought was really cool. Um, and then, like I said, it, for me, it just gives me like a, a sense of, um, peace to be able to sort of walk through it on my way to, um, to sometimes different meetings that I have to go to. So, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's probably my favorite place. I, I also really enjoy walking through the reading room just to see it. It just feels so academic to me and like what a college, you know, looks like. And, um, because Dwight is connected to the library, I have opportunities to walk through, um, the reading room a lot too. So those are right now my two favorite spots. Wonderful. I'll give you a tip. You should talk to Tom Clark in the Botanic Gardens. He is a plethora of information yes. and he's so great to talk to. And you can, yeah, he would ha- be happy to meet with you anytime if you wanted a, a private tour of the of the Botanic Gardens and the outside gardens and stuff. So yeah, you're absolutely right. I was uh, literally, I met, I mean, we had been in conversation for different for different things throughout the semester, but I met him personally probably our last day on campus I, I actually at the impromptu laurel parade that that was happening is where I actually finally got to meet him in person but um but we've been working with them on different projects this semester um a recent grant that he uh, applied for to do to add more pollinator species to the botanic garden so that's really exciting and then um we had some of our student workers that I was telling you about earlier worked with him to put on an event at the greenhouse, which was a really exciting event. It was really um, meant to be uh, sort of an event that was inclusive of students of color on campus and trying to see how they would um, use the greenhouse in different ways um, and have a conversation about, you know, the greenhouse as a space for everybody and what that would look like. And so I think Tom and the students talked about um, allowing for students to come in and grow some of the of the vegetables and the fruits that that sort of were common to them um, from wherever they came from, and I think it was a really cool discussion for everyone. I love hearing about all the ways each of the buildings on campus, um, like the art museum and the botanic gardens, are used as a classroom for students. Yeah, right. Well, and that's a big part of what we are trying to do with the campus living lab um, in the Miller Worley Center. Um, it's just exactly what you just said. Try to use the whole campus as a sort of a learning um, lab. Yeah. Well, have you had an opportunity to walk on any of the trails on campus? If so, do you have a favorite? Okay. I have done Upper Lake um, and I really love that as well. Um, so maybe that might be my favorite right now, but um, but I, I'm, I'm interested definitely in exploring more. So I'm actually going to be living um, when I come back in the fall, uh, across campus on faculty lane. So I'm really looking forward to, um, exploring more of the trails around campus. Wonderful. Yeah. So tell me what, what do you miss most about being on campus? I mean, well, I, luckily I still see my staff pretty regularly on zoom. Um, otherwise I, you know, I would definitely miss seeing and, and engaging with them, but I think the student energy is always, it's probably, you know, why academics do what we do largely. Um, and so I definitely miss the student energy, just, you know, uh, seeing them, there's just such a difference when you see them walk around campus and, um, you know, hear conversations. And, and so the student energy is, is really for me, um, key to, to what I do. And so that, I miss that a lot. I actually would have to agree with you. We all in the <laughs> association office, um, don't look forward as much to summer when the students aren't around and 
during the academic year, they're in the office and they're, you know, walking through the buildings and on campus. And it's such, you're right, it's such a great energy when everyone's on campus and so quiet during the summer months. But um, right. that's probably one of the things that I miss as well, the most about being on campus. So I was looking online at your profile that they have listed on the MHC website. And it says that you taught a course on sustainability, agriculture, and food equity. Mm -hmm. Um, have you been able to apply this to your new position in any way? So in some ways, I mean, I, we have a lot of students that are interested in food issues and I'm able to, when they you know, want to talk about programming around food, I'm able to really explore sort of um, the various perspectives that can be brought to the table around those issues. So we were planning on um, hosting a decolon decolonizing the East Coast food system panel um, on March 12th, I think it was. And I think March 10th is when we canceled public events on campus. So um, we had to cancel that event at the last minute, which was, which was I think, you know, it, we spent a lot of time preparing for that. I think the students were obviously sad about it. Um, but at the time, we just weren't sure how to quickly turn it into a virtual event. We were going to have seven panelists come from uh, all around um, the East Coast. They were all panelists of color that were working on um, food equity and food sovereignty in various capacities. So really being able, I think, with the planning stages of that to um, make sure people were attending to various perspectives and issues um, was helpful. And then I'll be actually teaching a course um, in the fall on food equity and empowerment. Um, so using that in my teaching, uh, well, I think will also be helpful. So yeah, I think just having that background and having done it um, allows me just to, to sort of go in depth with some of the questions that I think should be attended to when we have those conversations. Great. I think I want to attend one of those classes. <laughs> Sounds pretty interesting, actually. Yeah. Um, so tell us what your department's working on over the next 30 days and why it's important to share with us and the viewers today. Yeah, so I'm excited about this question. I, <clears throat> I think um, to give some context, you know, we, we spent uh, a lot of the time, as I said, talking with students this semester to really figure out what the perception was of students you know, and, and staff and faculty around campus uh, about what the Miller Worley Center provides. And then thinking about, you know, what were their needs that we maybe weren't intending to, that we could do better, you know, on campus. Um, so having these conversations on campus, um, it led to some of the different program we did, the greenhouse program that I talked to you about, you know, this food, food panel um, students were really excited about. Um, and, uh, and then we had this end of year retreat. So it's sort of taking a look at these conversations and the end of year retreat, what we really recognized is that students would like for us to be known as being available to more than just environmental studies students or students in the sciences, but to the whole campus. And they would also really like a space to help create community around a sustainable culture. And then I think also really, um, you know, it's, we do a lot of programming and we offer a lot of grants and, and opportunities, but, um, but I think perhaps our name isn't always attached to those opportunities. So figuring out how we could really um, maybe market or brand ourselves a bit more. <clears throat> so those were the big things that came out of it. And I think for me too, the other issue I was running into was just making sure that there were op easy opportunities for students and, and, and the community really to get engaged with the Miller Worley Center besides, um, you know, the, the eight worker positions in the, for students in the center. So I'm really thinking about how can we be more community oriented? <clears throat> How can we be more um, accessible to the whole community? And um, so some things that we're doing, we're actually doing a virtual program on um, 26th, I believe. Is that a Friday? I'll have to go to the calendar, but it will, we'll post it on, on our Facebook page again and on our um, Twitter page and then the Instagram page. Um, we'll be hosting Fred Baumgarten. Um, who uh, you know is di is director sort of of, of grants on campus? He is sort of a birding specialist, and so he's going to be um, hosting an intro to birding uh, virtually for anybody that's interested. Um, and so we'll be doing with that that with him, which I'm excited about. And so that's open to the whole community. Alums are welcome to um, register and attend, and we'll be getting that information out here soon. 
Um, and then I recently submitted a grant um, to, to host and to uh, execute a, a voting project, and which I is, I'm very passionate about. You know, students will always ask me, what can you do? Or not even students, but people will ask me, you know, what can we do to address, you know, these environmental issues that are so pressing right now? And there's a lot of individual things you can do, but at the, at the high level, I think when we really, where we really want to make a difference, um, you know, we've got to push for certain policies and, and we've got to have certain people in place who are willing to, to step up for those policies. And so voting is a very important part for me. And I think it's a good way to get the whole community engaged. So I'm, uh, my team and I are, are thinking through a voting project. Um, I hope we get this grant so we can actually execute it, but it would be sort of a, a peer networking challenge where teams would sign up. Again, it'd be great to have alums involved, um, but teams would, could sign up and um, and the, the goal would be to get as many committed voters um, on your team as possible. So it's sort of a challenge, a team challenge to see who could get as many committed voters from their communities, um, you know, from their peers um, engaged with, with voting this fall. Um, so that's another project that we're working on. Um, we'll find out in July if we get the grant. Um, and then we're really thinking through what student work might look like in the fall if, if students aren't on campus. So sort of re-envisioning what that might look like for the center um, and thinking about our grant uh, processes. So I told you, Tom, um, at the Botanic Garden applied for grants. I, we're really proud that, that people, not just students, but faculty and staff can apply for grants. And so we're thinking about how to reshape that process so that more people feel they have access to it and can use it flexibly um, so that they can, or with some flexibility so that they can um, really sort of meet their needs. And I think I was saying, you know, that we're interested in figuring out how we can sort of meet students' needs. Um, and so really having a, a grant program that allows people to tap into the miller Rowley Center and to build community um, around sustainability sort of in ways that they see um, are useful. So um, so I would say those are our, our big things on, uh, on the agenda for the next 30 days. It actually feels like a lot now that I'm saying it, but um, we can do it, we're good. Um, so that's, that's my hope. Sounds like it was a wonderful retreat. <laughs> it was a very good retreat. I, I think that those are just, it's so helpful when you can get some clarity and some vision and, and some ideas sort of brewing. Uh, well, I, I want to reference back to you uh, mentioning Fred coming on to do a birding. Um, yep. He actually was going to be doing the bird walks at reunion this year when, you know, if, if we had had reunion on campus. Um, we've had recently had an alum do a bird walk every Sunday. Um, oh, wow. Weekends, yes, on campus on Sunday morning. And um, Fred was going to do them this year. So I'm actually kind of excited to to see what he has to show. Great. Um, I am and, too. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, the pictures are probably going to be unbelievable. So I may have to check into that event and log on for it. So yeah, it, it'll be exciting. It's Friday. It's a Friday and it's going to be from 10 to 11. I'm looking at my calendar right now. Yep. Friday, the 26th from 10 to 11. Um, and and it's, on your website? it's on your website? It's, or? Not, it's probably not going to be. The website is actually a bit trickier for us to, to work with, but um, we'll, we'll put it on the virtual events on the Mount Holyoke calendar. And then, um, it will be on um, our Facebook page, Miller Worley Center for the Environment. And then uh, we'll also post it on our Twitter, also Miller Worley Center. And then our Instagram, which is Sustain Sustainable MHC. Great. Mm -hmm. So, Olivia, tell me, what is your favorite time of year for your job? Like, what, 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 what season is, is your favorite? Um, so I don't yet know how September, October, November, December are going to be, but uh, so April tends to be an exciting month for me because of Earth Day. Um, it's sort of the chance I get, I think, where I know people might be interested in seeing what environmental organizations are doing. And so I get very excited about it. I've always, I might be why I do what I do. I've always been enthusiastic about Earth Day. I think I was probably you know, in seventh grade, wearing my Earth Day t-shirt um, before many people celebrated it, uh, you know, in my in my grades. Um, so I, I get excited about Earth Day, and, and I think the whole week, you know, for a long time um, teaching, I would teach a project called No Impact, 
And um, I would, it would always fall, uh, you know, during the semester around the same time as Earth Week. So it just so happened that I would do my no impact week with my students during Earth Week, um, Earth Day week. And um, so it's been it's become sort of a meaningful week for me to really take time to reflect on my practices and my lifestyle. And uh, so I get excited when I can engage with others around conversations um, that are meaningful um, around environment, sustainability and justice. So. That's probably, I mean, because of that week that, you know, that's probably my favorite time. But um, I, I, you know, if I, if I can get this grant and do this voter project, I'll be really looking forward to, um, you know, the push towards uh, election day. Um, also, I really, I, I'm a big, you know, believer in voting. So I, I do love um, November for that reason, too. Got it. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to just um, ask the viewers, if they have any questions to make sure you put them in the chat box. Great. I haven't seen them here yet, but um, I also, I have one more question for you. Um, I know you're fairly new to campus and Mount Holyoke College, but I wondered if you had a favorite uh, MHC tradition that you've uncovered that you'd like to share with us. Well, I mean, what's so, was so powerful to me, and I mean, it like definitely brought me to tears was the impromptu Laurel Parade. And um, I just feel like, you know, we have some staff members and people in Dwight that are alums. And so um, it was really great to to sort of see how excited they were about doing this impromptu event for um, for the students uh, on campus. And, you know, I had um, one of our, our team members, Jordan, she like made stickers and made these posters. And, you know, so I came to campus and they were like, we're doing this. Can you you know, get involved, do you want to get involved and come out to the parade? And so I was like, sure. So I, you know, took some posters and went out there and it was just, it was my first time really knowing much about the, um, the event. And so to see it and to see so many people come out, um, at such a last minute and, um, to see the students, it just was really powerful. It was really powerful. We put a video of it on our Instagram page, um, the video that we took that day of the event. And so right now that's my favorite, but I, it, it just was, you know, it's such a meaningful um, event for me because it was sort of my first time and it was it was just really cool to see the whole community come out in support of, of seniors. Yeah. My role at the Alumni Association is reunion. So I plan reunions every year for the classes and um, work with the seniors and handle the parade and all that and uh, the Laurel Parade. And I can tell you that um, I, this would have been my sixth uh, reunion planning and every year, the Laurel Parade brings me to tears. Yeah. It, it is such an emotional uh, event for the senior class um, and for all the alums that are there supporting them. It's just such a fantastic event. I can't wait for you to see it in its fullest when the alums are back on campus yeah. in 2021. Um, <laughs> Because it'll be it'll be a different experience for you, but it'll be such a great experience. So, yeah, that I would have to agree. That's a that's a very good tradition that we we do have here. Um, yeah, I do, yeah. I do have a question. A couple okay. questions popped up. So, great. how is the Miller Worley Center addressing environmental racism? Mm, that's a I love that question. Um, you know what I would say is that what we are really um, what we're really, I think, trying to do is make sure that as a center ourselves, and actually we just put a statement out on um, Wednesday for shut down STEM and shut down academia um, to really focus on anti-racist practices. Um, so what I would say is as a center, we're really trying to focus on what we're doing on campus and the example that we're setting for our students in terms of how to be um, not only equitable and inclusive, but anti-racist. Um, and then I think when we can really make a good example of that on campus and, and, and do um, and, and have, I, I would say, practices that respond to that, um, then I think students will, will begin to sort of understand that rhetoric and be able to understand the problems with environmental racism such that we can tackle them a bit more. So I guess my point is really starting with ourselves as a center and thinking about our own practices and how we are addressing equity issues and how we are address addressing racism. And then really, um, I think using our own example to help set the tone for any kind of programming 
that we do. Um, and, and from there really um, hope that our, our students sort of take that, that on um, as they think critically about issues that, that they're sort of looking at. Um, so I, 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 you know, our biggest impact is probably in our programming and we were about to um, also work with another, with an indigenous community um, <clears throat> uh, in, in collaboration um, with Smith College. Uh, I can't remember some of the other uh, organizations that were involved in bringing um, this organization to campus to have sort of a sit in um, and really look at the, 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 the harm that many indigenous communities are under, undergoing right now um, due to environmental degradation um, and exploitation. Um, again, that didn't happen because of, uh, that was gonna happen actually the last day of our Earth Day celebration week on campus, but we weren't there for that. Um, and so again, just thinking really about programming as a way to, um, not only explore these topics, but really um, address them in a way um, that I think students can can think critically about. So I hope that I hope mm -hmm. that sort of answers some of that. Well, I, there is another question up here that's asking, what is environmental racism as distinct from racism in general? Yeah, I think that's a good question too. And um, I think adding the environmental part is being specific to, how is it that people are experiencing um, uh, environmental marginalization, you know, maybe marginalization due to environmental issues? Um, uh, so, for instance, you know, living close to toxic waste facilities, um, being in places that have um, more degraded air quality, um, and, and carrying the burden of that as opposed to other people. So it's really sort of the burden of these environmental issues being being heavily placed on already marginalized communities. Um, so adding that environmental component, I think is really just meant to take a, a closer look at the environmental inequities associated with marginalization um, of, of certain populations. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, another question came up, uh, could you talk a little bit about food desserts, especially as we are thinking about the many injustices that mark our world? Food deserts, okay. Desert, sorry, uh, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking food desserts, hmm, I love desserts. Food desserts. <laughs> My apologies. No, 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 that's okay. Food deserts, and I'm sorry, and then I got lost track because I was thinking of dessert. But what was the second part of the question? It says, um, could you talk a little bit about food deserts, mm -hmm. especially as we are thinking about the many injustices that mark our world? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, yeah. um, so I would just briefly say, because, I, you know, you can teach a whole class on food deserts, but I, I think in terms of just sort of for anybody who might not know, might not be familiar with it, this is the sort of um, the term we use for communities that really lack um, and, and there's an actual um, clear definition put out by, by a government, you know, by the government that says how you can define a food desert. But, but really, we're talking about communities that lack access to um, fresh and healthy, um, healthy foods that typically have to rely on fast foods and um, convenience stores for foods. And um, so um, a food desert you know, for various reasons, it might be somebody, a, a community that doesn't have transportation or they actually don't have grocery stores um, to get to, to available fresh and healthy food. Um, and so uh, I think I'm losing track of the question, um, but is, you know, in terms of issues that we're facing now, in terms of thinking about racial equities and, and those sorts of things, uh, I think this is a, an issue that a lot of people are looking at. I think that you know, there are a lot of activists actually ste stepping up um, and um, addressing this. But I think what's really cool, so I'm gonna get to the part that I think what's really interesting is that we see a lot of these communities actually now um, really taking this into their own hands and saying, you know, this is something that we can do. We can have food sovereignty and empowerment around our own food system and where our food comes from. And so um, what's really exciting is when you see communities sort of step up and start to grow their own food um, or activists in their communities step up and start to do that. And so we've seen a lot of that, which I think is really exciting. Um, so we just have to make sure that they have the resources to do what they want to do. You know, I, I am hesitant to ever say to my students, go out and, and you know, 
grow food for these communities, but rather, you know, ensure that there are resources, ensure that there are policies. Again, this is about voting um, that make sure that people have access to the resources they need so that if they want to grow their own food, that they can do that. Um, you know, and then what we're working on in my local community, but I'm here in Ohio right now. Um, and I think this is the case. I've, I've been in touch with the, the uh, director, Andrew Morehouse of the uh, Western Massachusetts Food Bank. Um, they are amazing. What they do is amazing um, work there, but really trying to make sure that people can use their SNAP um, benefits to get access to um, fresh and healthy foods at farmers markets. And then food banks have also done a great job of being able to bring in um, fresh, fresh vegetables and fruits into their food banks too. So again, this is all about policy and making sure that the right people are addressing this policy, making sure that SNAP, uh, there's still SNAP available to families that need it and that they can use it um, at farmers markets and that these food banks have access to um, fresh fruits and vegetables. So, so that's sort of where I see sort of the solutions at right now. Um, but I really hope that we can be innovative in, in some of those solutions and, and think um, think really creatively about that. Thank you so much, Olivia, for being here today. It was great getting to know you. And I look forward to seeing you on campus once we're all back. Yes, <laughs> I know, I know. It'll be exciting to be back. Hopefully we'll be able to you know, have a, a mechanism in which we can all interact safely with each other. Absolutely. Um, once again, <clears throat> thanks so much for um, everyone that's joined us today and for those who are watching the recording. Um, immediately after this webinar, you will see a survey. Please let us know what you think of our MNC series. And if you have someone in mind that you'd like um, as our next guest, please let us know. So um, again, thank you so much, Olivia. Have a wonderful uh, weekend. And thank you, you too. And I, I, I'm sorry I can't see people, but I, I would just say, feel free to, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, my, my email is oagular at mountholyoke.edu. And, um, and we also check out our Facebook page, our, our Twitter um, page, and then also our Instagram page for information on any of our um, events coming up. Um, but thanks so much for attending and being here. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.